title of the, my topic today is quite a curious one, I would say. The holiness of your sins. <laughs> now that doesn't sound very, uh, very good, very holy. That sounds pretty sinful, the holiness of your sins. What makes a sin holy? And if it's holy, it's not really a sin, it's a mitzvah. But the truth is, and this is really what we want to explore today, that uh, sins do have a holiness, <laughs> all their own. And Yom Kippur, contains some of that idea. Now when you read the, the textbooks of Yom Kippur, it would seem very strange because <coughs> all of Yom Kippur, we atone, we ask forgiveness, we, we say, I've sinned, forgive me, wash away my sins, remove the stains of my sins, etc., etc. So let's explore this a little bit on a deeper level. Let me begin with one curious, fascinating anomaly that we observe on Yom Kippur, and that is all confessions are plural. We never confess in the individual. We say, Asham nu, Bagad nu, Gazal nu, Al Chechachaton nu. Now, between person and person, we would not really be enthusiastic about somebody who confesses in a language that relates to the collective rather than the individual. Imagine somebody insulted you, or somebody denigrated you, somebody backstabbed you, somebody did something unjust to you, and they want to apologize. And they come to you and they say, we have sinned, we have stolen, we have betrayed you. Oh, get out of my house. Who's we? I. Take accountability, it's enough that you did it. Don't start blaming the collective. I. And yet, not once in the Yom Kippur confections do we speak about I. Asham ti, bagad ti, gazal ti, al ti lefanecha. No, chaton nu, we. Why? Second, the confessions in most Jewish communities are done with a song, and a very dramatic song. You go to most synagogues in Kippur, and this is what you'll hear. Now, just do this in the English, okay? I come to your house, I want to apologize, because I hurt you. And this is what I do. I backstabbed you, I slandered you, I defamed you, I stole from you. <laughs> well, that we dealt with. I betrayed you, or we even better, right? <laughs> we backstabbed you, we robbed you blindly, we made you lose your job. Ay, 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 ay. We lied to you. Get out of my house. What is this, a Broadway musical? You want to go to a musical? Go to a musical. What does a confession have with a musical? A confession is a confession. You don't do it with a sing song. You say, I'm sorry, I apologize. What's this whole song? And then by the al again, everybody together. V'yal kulam aleika slicha slach lanu mechalanu kaper lanu. It doesn't seem to reflect the nature of what we're doing. So let's put this... Uh, in our minds, for, let's store this away in our minds for a moment. We'll get back to it. I want to change the subject. Not completely, but a little, but a little bit. <coughs> a 
The Torah in the book of Leviticus, the portion of Emor, discusses the various holidays. When it comes to the holiday of Sukkot, which comes right after Yom Kippur, the Torah says that it happens on the 15th day of the seventh month, the 15th day of the month of Tishrei. Tishrei is the seventh month when we start counting with Nisan. So you have Nisan, Ir, Sivan, etc. Tishrei is the seventh, the 15th day is Sukkot. The way the Torah describes it at one point is Ulakachtam Lachem Bayom Harishon. On the first day of on the first day you should take the four species, the citron and the lulav, the frad, the, the branch of the palm tree and the willow and the myrtle branch, and you shake them. Asks the Midrash, why does the Torah suddenly refer here to Sukkot as the first day? It's not the first day of the month, it's the 15th day of the month. It seems very strange to call the 15th day the first day, and you have to figure out that you're not talking about Rosh Hashanah, you're talking about Sukkot. So the Midrash answers three words. It's called the first day because it's Rishon Lecheshben Avonos. It's the first day for calculation of sins. That's why the Torah calls Sukkot the first day. What is it a first day of? It's not the first day of the month, it's middle of the month. It's the first day that we calculate sins. So the commentators say, what does this mean? Why do we calculate sins that day? So the commentators to the Midrash say something very perplexing. On Yom Kippur, all sins are atoned. You come out of Yom Kippur, you have a clean slate. The four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, people are usually overly busy. You have to build a sukkah, you have to buy a lulav and esrik, you have to cook, you have to prepare. It's a stressful time. People are very busy so that they don't have time to sin. When people are busy, they usually don't have time to sin. When is the first opportunity for Jews to start sinning? So the commentators say, when is it? The first day of sukkahs. When the holiday comes, people are more relaxed. They come into the sukkah the first night. You sit down, you do some juicy gossip some juicy slandering, or whatever other interesting conversations you have in your sukkah. That's why it's called Rishon Lechesh Ben Avoynes. It's the first day for the calculation of sins, because Yom Kippur, the sins are absolved. After Yom Kippur, people are busy. When is the first night and day that Jews start sinning? The first day of sukkahs. This interpretation, even though it's classical, bothered Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Barditchev very much. How can we say that the Torah refers to Sukkot as the first day of sins. Such a pessimistic view of people. Is it not possible that some Jews will come into the Sukkah and they won't sin? Some Jews will come into the Sukkah and they'll speak words of Torah, words of love, words of inspiration. They'll sing melodies. Do we have to be so uh, negative? and believe that every Jew or many Jews start sinning on the first day of Sukkot, and the Torah could not find a better name for the first day of Sukkot than the first day because it's the first day of sins. There's plenty of Jews who don't sin on the first day of Sukkot. Very strange statement of the Medrash, Rishon Lechesh Ben Avoynes. So Reb Levi Yitzhak of Barditchev, who was one of the great spiritual masters of the late 1700s, early 1800s, the rabbi of Barditchev, which is a city in the Ukraine, he has a book called Kedushas Levi, The Holiness of Levi. His name was Levi, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak. And he gives there a phenomenal, extraordinary interpretation, which really explores the holiness of our sins. But first, I'm gonna change the subject again. On Rosh Hashanah, Jews have a tradition to go to the water. It's called Tashlech. Tashlech means to cast away. It's based on a verse in Micah. The prophet Micha says, yom kol You should throw away into the waves of the ocean all their sins. So we go to the ocean or to the beach in Miami or to the bay or to a stream or a lake or a river or a pond, and we symbolically cast our sins into the water. What does that mean? How do you throw sins into water if it was only as easy as that? But that's what we all do. We throw our sins into the water symbolically. And this is already a universal custom. Even Jews and temples that consider themselves to be very progressive <coughs> and very modern, Tashlich has become a very sacred tradition, people go to the water and they do what they do by the water. Okay, 
We go once more to the water. When do we go again to the water? Not today's days, but in temple days. They would go to the water on Sukkot. On Sukkot, you may know, there was a ceremony known as Simchat Beit HaShoeva, which means the joy of drawing water. Shoeva in Hebrew means to draw. Usha'aftem mayim besasan. The prophet says, draw water with joy. On Sukkot, every single morning, there would be a procession that would go down from the Holy Temple to the Shiloach Spring, Shiloach Spring, which you could still visit in the old city of Jerusalem. You ever went to the Shiloach Spring? And they would draw water into a flask, bring it back. They would go back up to the Temple Mount. The priest would go up to the altar and pour the water on the altar around the time of sunrise every morning of Sukkot. And the whole night before they did this, they would dance in the temple courtyard. It was known as Simchas Beis HaSheyeva, the joy associated with drawing the water. The point that the Talmud says, that Kol Mi Shalayra Simchas Beis HaSheyeva Lairah Simcha Meyamav. Somebody who did not see the joy of the drawing of the water did not see joy in their life. And I want to ask you a question. Why is that such an exciting thing to do? You take water, you fill it up, you fill up a cup with water from the spring, you bring it to the altar and you pour the water. Okay, seems a little strange, but fine. It's a mitzvah, another mitzvah. What's the joy? Why did they dance all night? What was the dancing all night for this mitzvah? called Nisu Chamayim, pouring the water. In fact, a whole year they would pour everyday wine on the altar. Every day. There was no dancing. Now between wine and water, what gets people more excited? We all know. <laughs> For the wine there was no dancing. For the water, which was once a year on the holiday of Sukkot, they were dancing and dancing a whole night. The sages say they didn't go to sleep on sukkahs. They would sleep, they would snooze on the shoulders of the people in front of them as they were dancing. Whoever didn't see that joy never saw joy. What was so exciting? Draw water with joy every morning of sukkahs. So Rosh Hashanah, you go to the water. Sukkahs, they went to the water. But sukkahs, they danced. Now it's interesting. That, today we don't go to the water on Sukkot unless it starts raining and then you have a lot of water in your Sukkah. So I guess you go to the water on some level. But then there was this whole procession. It was one of the special services done in the temple. The Sadducees disagreed because it doesn't say clearly in the Torah. This is part of the oral tradition. The Torah says to pour wine every day, but it doesn't say to pour water on Sukkot. This is Halacha Lamosha Messinai. It's an oral tradition and the Sadducees during the Second Temple, which disagreed of the, with the oral tradition, followed only the text the way they understood it, didn't like this mitzvah to the point that well, Alexander Janius, Alexander Yanai was one of the Hashmanoi kings, who was also a high priest, and when it came his time to pour the water on the altar, the Mishnah says in Sukkah, he poured it on his legs and he got pelted with a sroigim. What do Jews do on Sukkahs if they don't like you? They pelt you with their citrons, they pelted Alexander Yanai with a sroigim, and this was their response to him pouring the water on his feet rather than on the altar because he didn't believe in this mitzvah which was preceded by dancing all night. How do we make sense of all of these uh, items? So you remember the structure of this class? Because I don't. Okay, I do. We started off with, uh, you know what we started off with? Ashamnu, the collective rather than the individual. Then we discussed the Broadway musical which is inappropriate for a confession. Then from there we went to the concept of calling Sukkot the first day of sin. Very strange. From there we went to discuss the phenomenon of going to the water on Rosh Hashanah, going to the water on Sukkot. But on Sukkot it was preceded by dancing and celebration and, and music. It was huge, huge concerts. I don't know what we call it, concertos probably. A whole night of sukkahs, they would dance all night. The greatest of the sages would juggle, they would juggle. And they had candelabras that would light up the whole Jerusalem. It was an amazing, the greatest nights of celebration throughout the Jewish calendar were the nights of sukkahs. Until today, in Jewish communities around the world, we have remnants of this Simchas Beis Hasheva. People dance and sing and celebrate in the streets or in the sukkahs. Some communities, they have dancing hours of the night. 
and, uh, and it's a very lively time in the Jewish heart and in the Jewish world, in Israel and in the diaspora and most communities. And it's all originated in that tradition of the joy associated with pouring of water. And the answer to all of this, the, the understanding what is behind all of these enigmatic nuances in Jewish tradition, it all has to do with the holiness of sin. <laughs> with the holiness of sin. So, if you want to understand the structure of Jewish holidays, you really have to understand the structure of a relationship. Because, as Rabbi Akiva says in Mishnah, in Tractate Yadayim, all the books of the Bible are holy. But the uh, Song of Songs is the Kodesh Kadashim, is the holiest of the holy. Now, the Song of Songs is a love poem. In fact, there's no religious message in the Song of Songs. It's the only book of the Bible which has no moral instruction, no religious precepts. Even the book of Esther, it's a history tale, but it's a tale about providence, about some inner force pulling the strings together. The book of Song of Songs, it's graphic, it's sensual, it's intimate, and it's about a boy and a girl who break all the rules, basically. And mommy and tati and the system are trying to separate them because he's supposed to be in school, she's supposed to be in school, he's supposed to be shepherding the flock, she's supposed to be in school, and they're basically met illegally, and they fell in love, and they keep on chasing each other, running from each other, chasing each other. It's a classic crush of teenagers who the parents are very upset about this relationship. That's what it would seem like. Now, it's very romantic. It's beautiful, it's heartwarming, but it doesn't seem to be very Jewish. And yet Rabbi Akiva said, it's the holiest book of the Bible. Why? It's holier than everything. Why? Because Jerashirim is a metaphor. It's a metaphor of the relationship between God and Israel, between heaven and earth, between the soul and the body. But it's more than that. It's written in such graphic terms to teach us that essentially, for love and romance in our world to be meaningful and enduring is when love and romance reflects the spiritual relationship. A love that is divorced from spiritual relationship is a love that is short-term and could be a love that is even vile and vulgar. Now, this is not the place to discuss what's going on now in uh, the political reality of America. For that, you have debates tonight. So from the Yehudi, you can go to the debates, from paradise to purgatory, from heaven to hell. Um, uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to do that because I'm going to be on the airplane, and I doubt they're going to show those the debates on the airplane. Well, I'll have to uh, hear the, re the replays of the great brilliance, uh, the great brilliant remarks apologies or whatever that are going to happen tonight, but certainly it's going to be a circus. And probably George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln are not very happy in their graves uh, when they think about, uh, forget who's going to win, who the candidates, uh, who the candidates that we're dealing with, whichever, whoever you're voting for or not voting for. Okay, but from a Jewish perspective, love, romance, sexuality, intimacy, are very deep forces, we know this, but for them to uh, really be powerful and enduring, they ought to be associated with a soul relationship. A physical relationship that is divorced from a soul relationship is superficial. It's skin deep, it's powerful. You can ask Trump, you can ask uh, Bill, it's powerful, but it's, it's not deep, it's not authentic. It's very potent, especially for men, as Giuliani explained eloquently today. But it's not, it's not <coughs> deep. What do I mean? It's not deep, it's not enduring. And this is true with a marriage too. Couples that their attraction is merely physical, but not spiritual. In other words, they don't share values. They don't respect each other's personalities. So their intimacy lacks intimacy. There may be sexuality, but no intimacy. Intimacy is made up of three words, into me see. Into me see requires a lot of vulnerability, 
requires the ability to strip your garments and to be able to look at yourself and allow other people to see you in a very profound way. So sexuality in Judaism, never, Jews never ran away from sexuality. We're not Christians. I was talking to a Christian and I said, you got it wrong. You thought it says celibate. It doesn't say celibate, it says celebrate. In Judaism, intimacy is, is celebrated, it's, it's sacred. Nachmanides writes that it's the holy of holies of, of the Jewish religion. But the Song of Songs tells you the story. Love is powerful when it's a metaphor, when it, the physical is a continuum of the spiritual. And that's why, if you want to understand the structure of our high holidays, it's about a relationship and about intimacy. We have now two months that are loaded with holidays, and for most Jews, they're loaded with guilt. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, for most Jews, or many Jews, it's full of a heavy feeling. How many people enjoy Rosh Hashanah? How many people enjoy Yom Kippur? It's just, here we go again. The day of judgment, the day of confession. Leave me alone. Somebody asked me, what's the definition of a Jew? And I said that if he doesn't feel guilty, he blames himself. <laughs> We're guilt-ridden in a good day. After you eat a latke, you're guilt-ridden because too much oil. After you eat a hamantash, you're guilt-ridden because too many sesame seeds and too much carbs. After you eat matzah, you're guilt-ridden because it's mamish carbs. After you eat cheese blintzes and shvuis, you're guilt-ridden. When are you not guilt-ridden? Yom Kippur is all about guilt. It's very hard for Jews. We carry a lot on our shoulders. I come from New York, there's a concept called jury duty. You know what jury duty is? You get summoned to be in a jury, everyone has to go. And you need a good excuse to get out of it. So I have my excuses, but there was a Jewish woman there, and the way she got out of it was she told the judge that she was guilty. <laughs> Somebody asked you, what's the difference between Italian mothers and Jewish mothers? I said, they both make pasta for dinner. Both of their 16-year-old teenagers come home, taste the pasta and say, Ma, it's horrible. I'm not eating this pasta. You, you won't, I won't take money to eat it. I wouldn't eat it if I was dead, nor would I feed it to the devil. That's how horrible this pasta is. I can't even conceive how somebody could make such sickening spaghetti. That's what 16-year-olds are like, especially when they're, you know, their attitudes are flying high. And both mothers shoot. They both shoot. The difference is the Italian mother shoots her boy and the Jewish mother shoots herself. So, these holidays are very, very intense. And I would say many Jews have been alienated from them. People think everybody comes to Shor Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's not true. In Manhattan, how many Jews live in Manhattan? Let's say 500,000, 600,000. Count all the shuls, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Chabad, Hasidic, Ultra-Orthodox, Reconstructionist, Gay, any synagogue, Renewal, Chabura, Bagel and Locks, any type of synagogue you want, count how many seats you think you'll have in the whole Manhattan. How many seats? 12,000 at best. But there's 500,000 Jews, where are they going? Okay, a few are going to Westchester to their parents, a few are going to Long Island. Most Jews don't go to Shor Hashanah Yom Kippur. It's a fallacy, we think most Jews go to Shul. A lot of Jews go to Shor Hashanah Yom Kippur. Most Jews don't step into a Shul because it doesn't speak to them. They went as kids, everybody went as kids. Their grandmother and grandfather schlepped them once a year, Yom Kippur or tw three times a year, they sat for four hours and it was the most boring experience of their life. At least in Hebrew school, you could throw spitballs. You remember? You could do spitballs with, 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 with straws. In synagogue, you can't. So you sit like a glump for four hours and one thing you know, the moment you become independent, the moment you're going to college, you ain't returning to this place again. And they're reading words that are completely irrelevant to them, which is the crisis of a Judaism that's completely irrelevant. There were three rabbis, progressive, we were talking the other day about how progressive their shuls are. So one says, you know, our shul is really modern. We, we got rid of all the old stuff. It's Yom Kippur. Everybody who comes in gets a few sushi platters. So if they get hungry in the middle, they can eat some sushi. Second rabbi says, eh, big deal. Our shul is really progressive. Near every seat is a laptop. 
At any point in the services, you could serve the web, you could update your Facebook account, you could see what's going on, you could follow Trump and Hillary, it's all good. The third rabbi says, nah, this is old stuff. Our shul is really, really modern and progressive. Before, the, before Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we put up a big sign, closed for the holidays. <laughs> so that's what it is for most people. To really understand Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, you have to go into the model of relationships. The way a relationship works is, <laughs> there's dating, then there's proposal, and then hopefully she agrees, and then you get ready for the wedding, and then there's a wedding, and there's a chuppah, and there's dancing, and then there's seven days of festivity, and then there's a honeymoon, and then life begins, and good luck. There was a Jewish couple celebrating their 50th anniversary. So she says, I want to make a toast to myself for sticking it out with him for 50 years. And I want to tell you that the 50 years went by like two days. People were impressed. A Jewish couple, after 50 years, they're on speaking terms. And not only that, it went by like two days, but there was a nudnik. And he says, why do you say like two days? Why don't you say it went by like one day? Why two? She says, because our marriage 50 years went like two days, felt like two days. Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. Right? So fine. So that's after the honeymoon. Okay. Now, if you want to really look at this, come back to the Jewish calendar, and you'll see it's all in the, it all begins in the Jewish calendar. It's the two months, Elul and Tishrei. Elul, the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneir Zaman, says in Lakut Torah that Elul, the king, is in the field. What is he doing in the field? We call it in English dating. He's in the field, he's relaxed, he says he's smiling. You know, during dating, men are, uh, they, they, I always say, you know, whenever you see a, a man holding the door open for the girl to go into the car, it's one of two things. Either it's a new wife or a new car. <laughs> so the, during the month of Elul, the king is in the field. It's a time that God says, I want to just get to know you. Let's hang out together. That's Elul. Comes Rosh Hashanah. What happens Rosh Hashanah at night? Rosh Hashanah at night, God proposes. That's Rosh Hashanah. The energy of Rosh Hashanah is an energy of serious question. Are you going to say, yeah? The night of Rosh Hashanah, the groom, the boy turns to the girl. The young man turns to the young woman. In this case, God turns to the Jew and says, I'm crazy about you. I want to be with you. We should be together forever. I know I'm not the easiest, uh, <laughs> the easiest soulmate. To be in a relationship with God means to be in a relationship with infinity, to be in a relationship with mystery, to be in a relationship with ultimate meaning, with, with limitless reality. It's tough. It's much easier to be in a relationship with bagels, with cheese danishes. They're not infinitely mysterious. It's pretty clear, the poison. But a relationship with God is complicated. It's very diff The relationship with God is very serious. It's very real. It's very authentic. To quote Abraham Joshua Heschel, if God does not amount to everything, he amounts to nothing. You got that? Think about it. So the woman tells the guy, I need, I need a, this is, we were just dating four weeks. It's four weeks. You know, on the west side, you date for, for 16 years, and it's still not enough. Uh, some places of Manhattan, 22 years. Uh, you know, you get married when you're 80, when you're 90. So fast, four weeks, it's almost like the Hasidic groups. God says, listen, you know, you want to date, we could date for another 40 years, but let's face it, we belong together. So the girl says, the Jew says, give me a night, let me think it over. Rosh Hashanah in the morning, we tell God we have an answer. We blow the chauffeur. The chauffeur is a way of saying yes. So God says, okay, let's get married. The Jew says, when? He says, Yom Kippur. I got to prepare. He says, I give you 10 days. <laughs> but a wedding, you don't prepare for wedding. And then he says, no, the caterer belongs to me. The florist belongs to me. The hall belongs to me. I could do a wedding in a few days. Just prepare. So the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you're preparing for the wedding. Yom Kippur is the wedding. So on Yom Kippur, what do we dress like? We dress white. Why do we dress white? Because that's what a bride dresses at a wedding in white. We fast on Yom Kippur. The Jewish custom is that the bride and the groom fast on the day of the wedding. It's the day of our wedding. That's why we fast. People say, why are we fasting Yom Kippur? Because you're getting married. 
and you get married, you can't go with a full fressing stomach. Imagine men wouldn't fast the day of the wedding. They already eat for 25 years before that. The day of the wedding, you have to be a little clear. You gotta empty the stomach. Feel the pangs of hunger, nothing will happen. Nobody dies from fasting for a few hours, especially Jews, they eat a meal before Yom Kippur, after Yom Kippur, it's fine. And if you ever saw the meal after Yom Kippur, it looks like they haven't eaten in four months. So Yom Kippur is the wedding. How does the wedding begin? It begins with, uh, with the prayers. The first part of the wedding is always solemn. It's always solemn. It's serious. And it's a very deep commitment. And that's what Yom Kippur is. The first thing you do in Yom Kippur, as we spoke, Kal Nidra, you absolve your vows to people. Because you can't be married to somebody if you're married to other people. And if you're married to yourself. You can't be married to another person if you're married to yourself. Did you get that, young men? You first have to divorce yourself in order to marry somebody else. That's why in Talmud, the tractate for divorce comes before the tractate for marriage. Why? So some people think because the sages were prophets and they knew about Hollywood. And in Hollywood, you get divorced before you got married. In the middle of the wedding, they already planned the divorce. On a deeper level, you have to get divorced from your own ego before you could let somebody else in. So Yom Kippur is really a very intense day. It's the day of the wedding, the first half of the wedding, which is very solemn, it's very serious, it's very introspective. There's the veil, the badekinish in the beginning of the wedding, and what the veil is saying is, the groom tells the bride, I know that much of you I don't see. And I'm ready to marry the part of you that I don't see as much as the part that I see. One of the biggest challenges in America is people think they're marrying the people that they think they're marrying. Did that make sense? People think they're marrying the people that they think they're marrying, but you never marry the person you think you're marrying. People change all the time. So marriage really is a commitment to this person, even when I'm going to see things that I don't see today. Of course I'm going to see new things that I don't see today. But I want, I know you're the type of person you are. I want to hold your hands even through the unpredictable realities. If that's possible, sometimes there's abuse or sometimes there's different circumstances beyond expectations that a person has to separate or divorce, especially when there's abuse or other similar situations. But I'm talking about in situations where there's no abuse, but there are idiosyncrasies. People are so different. So it's really a commitment that's like Nasev and Nishma. The Jews, when they married God, they didn't know everything. There was a veil, there was a Badekinesh. I'm committed to you. And I know that a lot of you I don't see. You know, people say, what's the difference between men and women? I say, I'll tell you the difference. Women, most women, marry most men believing that they're going to change. The guy's a slob, but he'll live with me for a year and he'll become a mensch. Most women think men are going to change, but the truth is men don't change. Very few men change. Now the other way, most women marry, mo most men marry most women believing they're not going to change. <laughs> but women constantly change. Women change every day. Most women change every hour, some every minute. So they think their women are not going to change. They're always changing. So it's a very interesting paradox you have. So the first part of Yom Kippur is really that marriage. Then you come to Ne'ila. Ne'ilah is the highlight of Yom Kippur, the last prayer. What does Ne'ilah mean? Closure. Why is it called Ne'ilah? So every Beis Yaakov girl here knows. Why is it called Ne'ilah? One of the girls will tell us. What do you learn in school? Why is it called Ne'ilah? Because it like closes up. Very good. She learned well. She got an A on her exams. Because they basically tell you the gates of heaven are about to close. It's like the garage is coming down. If you're caught under it, your head will be hurt. So, so either get in or get out, but the gates are coming. And what's the feeling by Jews? You have like another few seconds to throw in your petitions because God is like, cut off time. Come on, give me a break. Imagine your child comes to spend the day with you, right? It's now six o'clock in the evening and you tell your son or your daughter, you're like, okay, in a few minutes I'm turning into a pumpkin. The doors are going to close, so therefore tell me the last thing you want and then get out of here. That's Ne'ilah, that's the end of the relationship. Ne'ilah means something else, listen to this. Ne'ilah means the gates of heaven close during the Ne'ilah, but you're inside. In other words, it's a time of intimacy. It's the Yichud room after the Chuppah. 
Do you ever see a Jewish chuppah? What happens after the chuppah? The groom and the bride go into a room alone. Even the photographer leaves. Do you know what that means? Even the shvigger, the mother-in-law, is not allowed to be there. And she's always present. <laughs> but even the, the rabbi they chase out. I know the weddings I did. And there's always good food by the yichud room. Sushi, cakes. But the interesting thing is the groom and the bride never touch it. It's usually for me and the photographer. We come in afterwards and we finish everything up. <laughs> I also fast on days of weddings because I know I can eat everything in the yichud room. It's a beautiful meal. And I always wonder why the groom and bride never eat the food there. So I once asked them, why don't you eat the food? And the guy said it was so exciting, I didn't have to eat. But you fasted a whole day. You'll see most Jews during the ilah, at the end, when they say Shema Yisrael, they don't feel hungry. A whole day Jews are quetching in shul that they're hungry. Just one, or one cup of water, one cup of water. What could one cup of water do? A whole day they quetch. Ready when Yom Kippur starts, Jews are quetching. You just ate a whole day. No. You ever notice right when Yom Kippur starts, you're starving? I don't know why. When Yom Kippur starts, everybody is starving, everybody is thirsty. They just ate like beasts for three hours, no difference. And then Yom Kippur day, forget about it. You don't talk to people then. They're in a bad mood. By Ne'ilah, by Shema Yisrael, people don't feel hungry. It's like the Yichud room. Because it's a moment of intimacy with God. The groom and the bride are so excited about the new marriage that they, the adrenaline is flowing, the endorphins are released. They don't, the, adre the adrenaline is so powerful, they don't have to eat. At Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lakim, the end of Neila, it's the Yichud room. Now what happens after the groom and the bride come out of the Yichud room? Now starts the dancing. So what happens after Yom Kippur? Sukkot. You have four days in between for pictures. <laughs> But, okay, you missed that, fine. But then comes Sukkot, Sukkot is the dancing. That's why Sukkot is a happy holiday. It's the second half of the wedding. And you dance and dance and dance. Everyone is at the wedding. It's an outdoor celebration. Seven days of Sukkot, the wedding is over. Now what happens? The lights go off. You pay the caterer $80,000. Pay the florist $30,000. Hopefully you have the money. You pay the guy of the bar $200,000 for all the drunkards who drank. You pay everybody. And now the groom and the bride go home. Nobody comes. Not the shvigir, not the matchmaker. And now it's time to start what we call playing house. Building a life together with God's grace. Consummating the marriage. What is that in Jewish life? Shmini Atzeres and Simchas Torah. The sukkah ends, you go back into the house. And this is a time of intimacy. The hakafas, the dancing with the Torah in Shul, the last days of Sukkot, is a form of intimacy. That's why we pray for rain then. What is rain? Rain is the sperm of heaven that comes down and it's absorbed by Mother Earth. It fer it's, it's, it's conceived, fertilized, developed by Mother Earth. That's what rain is. It's essentially the cosmic metaphor for intimacy between God and the Jewish people, between the groom and the bride. And the Arizal even says that the seventh day of Pesach, the sea opens, the sea splits, the cosmic womb opens, and the first souls are born. The souls that were conceived on Simchas Torah during the intimacy between heaven and earth. So Simchas Torah is intimacy. It's very deep celebration. Very deep, intimate celebration. What happens after Simchas Torah? You have one more day called Israchak, the end of Tishrei, where there's still no confession for sins. It's like the honeymoon. What happens after the honeymoon? Comes the month of Cheshvan. The month of Cheshvan, everybody knows, is the most boring month in the Jewish calendar. Not one holiday, not one special day. That's what happens after the honeymoon. Now life becomes very boring and monotonous and you have to find the joy in taking out the garbage, in buying roses on Friday, in doing little small things for each other. And this is where many marriages fall apart. Because once the lights are off and the excitement is gone, you have to build a different type of relationship. This is where real Jewish life happens. They once asked a cardiologist, why do Jews have so many cardio problems? So he said, because most Jews I know will always tell you, I'm a Jew in my heart. So all their Judaism 
is focused on their heart. You know how much stress on their heart there is? But if they could distribute their Judaism to their arms and their legs, so their heart wouldn't have so much Judaism, it would be a little healthier. So that's what happens after Tishrei Cheshvan becomes a different type of reality. Now you have to find God in the daily monotonous routines of life. So this is the relationship. It starts with dating and Elo, proposal, preparation, marriage, chuppah, ne'ila, the yichud room, the dancing, the intimacy, the honeymoon, and then settling down and finding meaning in the daily relationships. Now here, when we can understand it in terms of a relationship, we now come to the next level to discover the holiness of sins. So you see, the Talmud teaches something very profound. When somebody repents out of awe, out of fear, their sins are absolved. When somebody repents out of love, their sins become mitzvahs. That's what Rish Lakish says in Tractate Yuma, page 86b. That's what the Talmud teaches, Yuma Pevav. Tshuva out of fear absolves the sins, obliterates the sins. Tshuva out of love transforms the sins into mitzvahs. <coughs> well, how can you transform a sin into a mitzvah? What does that mean? What does the Talmud mean? The answer to this, my dear friends, is as follows. When somebody makes a mistake, when somebody falls, when somebody experiences a tremendous downfall in life, but they manage to get up and recreate their life, there is something in the depth of their new life that exists only because of the struggle, only because of the mistake. Ask anybody who has been in addiction and then went into recovery. And if they are truly in recovery, there is something very powerful and deep about these souls that you will never have with somebody who didn't go through the process of tremendous, tremendous addiction. Why? Because if I fall, but I use my mistakes, I use my transgressions as a catalyst, as a springboard to a life of renewal, I appreciate the truth in a way that somebody else can't appreciate it. Just like a person who has been stuck in a forest for two days and then you give them a cup of water, their enthusiasm in drinking that water is different than a person who always had access to water. And somebody who hasn't seen a bed in two days and you give them a bed, their appreciation of that bed surpasses a person who has a bed every night. Somebody who's been to prison and then they come out in freedom, their appreciation of freedom is not one that a free person can even understand. When Gilad Shalit, who was sitting by the Hamasniks in Gaza for five years in a cell in captivity, when he walks in at night and goes into a bed, he does not take it for granted like you and I take it for granted. Now, thank God we could take it for granted. I heard from Eli Wiesel, who just passed away a few months ago, he said, there's nobody who experiences gratefulness like us survivors. We take nothing for granted. There's breakfast in the morning, really? Wow. People who for five years were stripped from all humanists, reduced to skeletons, and their value of their lives was less than the value of a cockroach. Literally, as an Auschwitz survivor told me once, he says, for a German to kill a Jew, it took less thought than you smacking a mosquito that's biting you. Less thought, much less thought for you to kill a mouse is far more difficult. To trap a mouse is far more difficult because uh, every Jew when you put on a mouse trap starts having issues. Who gives me the right to trap the mouse? Maybe the mouse should trap me, but, if the, but I paid for the house so if the mouse traps me, whatever it is, you know how Jews are. Not so simple, a mouse trap. Every Jew makes a chesh, but they have to go to therapy because they put out a mouse trap and Pita may be after you. <laughs> In fact, I know there was uh, uh, this fellow who, uh, this guy, you know, I'm sorry, this mouse who was in a Jewish house and, and she loved the house because there was a lot of cheese, so it was great. But then they bought a cat and the mouse became, you know, miserable. So the mouse turned to God and said, God, could you make me a cat? God said, of course. So the mouse becomes a cat. But then they bought a dog. 
So the cat became miserable. So the cat says to God, could you make me a dog? God says, of course. Becomes a dog. But now the guy decided to discipline the dog. So the dog became miserable. So he says, God, could you give me happiness? God says, what do you want? To make me the man of the house. Sure, he becomes the man of the house. Now his wife comes home. And he's terrified, like, you know, most Jewish husbands. So he's terrified from her. So he's like, God, God, I wanted to be happy. God says, what do you want? He says, make me the woman of the house. No problem. So now he's the woman of the house, standing in the kitchen, confident, and suddenly she sees a mouse. <laughs> and you know what happens when a woman sees a mouse? I don't have to tell you. So she turns to God and says, God, God, please, make me. God says, what do you want? She says, I want to be the mouse. God says, you were the mouse, you idiot. That's what you were. But that's how life is, you know, I'm trying to please you. You're trying to please her. She's trying to please him. He's trying to please her. And you're trying to please me. <laughs> that's the cynicism of life. So you see, my friends, people have this issue. So Elie Wiesel said, the way we have gratefulness, nobody has gratefulness. When somebody makes mistakes, when somebody lies, when somebody cheats, when somebody insults, when somebody does something that's promiscuous, they have remorse, they reinvent their life, the sin becomes a tremendous component of their new discovered life because it's the negative experience that when you convert it into a positive energy, it gives the positive energy a depth that it never had on its own. To put it a little bit in, uh, in more, uh, maybe a different words, they say there was a guy, uh, uh, Henry Watson, Watson, he was a legendary manager. He was the legendary manager of IBM. And uh, the CEO, and there was a manager there who made a terrible mistake. And he cost the company Ten million dollars in losses. The next morning he was summoned by the CEO and he gave in his resignation papers. He says, listen, there's no way I could, I can make up what I did. I'm grateful for the years here and I just, I apologize. You know, and he was just ready to resign. No severance pay, let him just get out of here. And it was unintentional, it was, but it was a mistake. And the CEO looks at him and says, you're leaving? Says, of course I'm leaving after what I did. He says, you ain't leaving. He was shocked. He says, you're leaving? I just spent $10 million on your education. You're not leaving. And this was one of the most brilliant moves he did because the loyalty that he engendered and he created in that person, you can't buy. You can't buy loyalty. It's one of the problems CEOs have. They raise salaries, they give bonuses, but you can't buy loyalty. But this person's dedication to the company from that day on was infinite. It was unparalleled. So you see, when your mistakes become an education, they're not mistakes, they're educational. So a mistake is only a mistake if I don't learn from it. But if I learn from it, and I rediscover myself, I reinvent myself, then the mistake retroactively turns out to be your greatest educational moment. In fact, from success you don't learn. From mistakes you learn. I'll never forget probably the first or second Shabbaton I did in my life. I was a little younger than I am today. I'm still a baby, but then I was a bigger baby. And it was maybe the first or second weekend retreat I did. I was really, really inexperienced. Like, really. It was in Chicago. I do this weekend. I thought I wasn't so bad. I thought, okay. Sunday morning, the president of the synagogue, who's still around, is an elderly Jew, very wealthy Jew, big community, very nice, established community, good rabbi who, who, who invited me to come, calls me in and was sitting by the rabbi. And I thought he was going to say thank you, it was beautiful. He sits me down, we're sitting by now, me and the rabbi, and the president looks and says, you were horrible. You were so bad. In fact, you were an embarrassment. My wife is a PhD in psychology. I brought her Friday night to your lecture. It wasn't even 101 basics. Who do you think you are to speak to PhDs the way you spoke without an education? 
who prepared you, who trained you. 25 minutes did he give me a speech. I felt bad more even for the rabbi than for myself. Because the rabbi was a very nice guy and he, and he kept, so he called me, he called me and he says, he tells me in Yiddish, Nemem nishtazoi erenst. Don't take him so seriously. So he hears, he says, no, take me very seriously. You were really, really bad. <laughs> And he went on and on explaining to me all my mistakes, everything I did wrong in every lecture. And the poor rabbi says, eh, it wasn't so bad. He says, no, it was worse. <laughs> and he finishes. It's not fun to hear. It's not fun to hear, especially when you're just starting, you know. Unless you hear it from your wife, then it's a good thing to hear because it keeps you humble. But to hear it from other people. So... Uh, he finishes. Okay. It is what it is. Yeah, you, 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 these things happen. Yeah, what do they say? Spaghetti happens. I get up to walk out to go to the airport. He comes over to me and he says, But in retrospect, this will be your most successful Shabbaton. So I thought he's schizophrenic. I thought he's toit meshuga. First, he tells me I was the disaster of a lifetime. Now he, he says, You know why? because you're going to learn from this. Because really you're good, he tells me. <laughs> but you don't know it yet. So you learn from this, and you'll see that this will be your most successful Shabbat Tov. Because <laughs> you'll learn from every mistake you made, and you'll become good. And it was very profound what he did. It took courage, it took confidence, but it was profound. And you know what? He was right. Because when you're good, and people say thank you, there's nothing to learn from. <laughs> you become smug, right? And you become complacent, and you go eat. But when, you, when you're not good, when you fail, but then somebody helps you channel the failure into a lesson, then the failure becomes far more successful than success. Because it prompts awareness. It generates perspective. It expands horizons. You don't learn from success. You learn from failure. You don't learn from arrogance and smugness. You learn from humility. And that's why the Talmud says when somebody repents out of love, the sin becomes a mitzvah. Why? Because the new love that they have could have only come about as a result of the mistakes, of the sins, of the transgressions. We spend $10 million on your education. There's nothing like the education that comes from failure, even though it's very vulnerable. It's painful, but that's what it is. Let me put it a little bit in abstract halachic terms. How many of you are familiar with the expression heksher mitzvah? Heksher mitzvah means every mitzvah needs preparation. I want to blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah, I have to make a shofar, I have to buy a shofar. Buying a shofar is not a mitzvah, but it's the prerequisite for a mitzvah. I want to eat matzah on Passover, I have to bake matzah. Baking matzah is not a mitzvah, but you can't eat if you don't have baked matzah. I'm going to sit in a sukkah on Sukkot, I have to build it. I have to buy wood, I have to buy bamboos. Buying bamboos ain't a mitzvah. But it's the heksher mitzvah, it's the prerequisite. Every mitzvah you put on tefillin, you have to make the tefillin. You light Shabbos candles, you need to get matches. You need a candle, etc. Clear, right? There's no mitzvah without a preparation. A mikvah. Of course, going to the mikvah is the mitzvah. But if there's no structure, if there's no water, you can't have a mikvah. So now I want to ask you a question. Think about this. Every mitzvah has heksher mitzvah. What you do in order to do the mitzvah, the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? The precursor, the preliminary, preliminaries. Now there's a mitzvah called tshuva, repentance. What's the heksher mitzvah of tshuva? <laughs> what's the preliminary for tshuva? Admission is when I'm doing it. But what's the prerequisite to be able to? Sin. Sin. So the prerequisite for the mitzvah of tshuva is what? 
is sin. But that's a strange idea. Because sin is the opposite of a mitzvah. It's not like buying a lulav. Sin is doing against what God said. So what do you mean? That's the preparation for the mitzvah. So here we have quantum mechanics in Judaism. When I do the sin, I'm doing a sin. Okay? But here it is how it works. If after I do the sin, I repent, so the sin leads me to a deeper appreciation of God and truth and justice and morality. So retroactively, the sin is redefined from being a sin, it becomes a heksher mitzvah. It becomes the prerequisite that allowed me to do tshuva. But that can only happen retroactively after I did tshuva, which is how the Arizal resolves the big paradox between human choice and divine knowledge. Everybody had this question when they were 14. If God knows everything I'm going to do, you remember when you were 14? And you came to your teacher and they said, uh, when you'll get older you'll understand and you still don't understand? If God knows everything I'm going to do, so then I have no choice. Because I can't misprove him, I can't disprove him. And if I prove him right, so then he already decided. And if I prove him wrong, then he doesn't really know. So the Arizal says that there are parallel universes. <laughs> There's a universe in which I choose. There's a universe in which God decides. In my world, I chose. In God's world, He decided. The question is, do these two worlds come together? If I don't do tshuva, my world remains divorced from God's world. So I sinned. Okay, it was my choice. If I do tshuva, basically what I'm saying is, God chose it. If God chose it, it must have been a good thing. What was so good about it? It led me to tshuva. So when I do tshuva, I align my universe with his universe, and the two parallel universes merge into one. So that the sin is not a sin anymore, the sin is a mitzvah. That's what the Talmud means, that when you do tshuva out of love, your sins are transformed into mitzvahs. Now come with me and you'll see the whole calendar is based on this. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, are dominated by a feeling of awe. Sukkot is dominated by a feeling of joy. We discussed the two stages of the wedding. The first half of the wedding is solemn. The second half of the wedding is festive. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is more introspective. Sukkot is much more festive, joyous, extroverted. It's like the dancing at the wedding. This is Chuvat of awe, this is Chuvat of love. In Chuvat of awe, God obliterates the sins. In tshuva out of love, the sins are transformed into mitzvahs. So therefore, Sukkot is called the first day when he calculates sins. Why is he calculating your sins on Sukkot? Because Rosh Hashanah Yim Kippur, he threw away your sins. But now comes Sukkot. Sukkot is a time of love. Love you bring your sins into the equation because the sin itself is a mitzvah. So what is Sukkot called? The first day of calculation of sins. He says, let's now calculate the sins because every sin becomes a mitzvah. Where do you see this in Jewish ritual? On Rosh Hashanah we go to the water. What do we do by the water? We throw away our sins. Sukkot, we come back to the water. What do we do on Sukkot? we take the water back and we pour it on the altar like a sacrifice. In other words, on Sukkot you go back and you reclaim your sins and you bring them up to the altar and you pour them. They become holy. Because on Rosh Hashanah you're in a state where you have to say, I don't like what I did. I get rid of it symbolically. On Sukkot you mature and you say, you know what? Your past, you don't cut away your past. You have to elevate your past. You have to learn from your past. There's two stages in recovery. One stage is, my past was horrible. Never, never again. That's important. But then there's stage two. Stage two is, you have to be able to say thank you for my past. It taught me something I would never know. Yes, people often say, I would never want to go through that. But once I went through it, I would never not want to go through it. I'm not giving it up so easily. Because all struggle 
could become a catalyst for unprecedented growth. I remember when I was sitting shiva for my father. So I turned to my nephew, who was close to my father, and I said, you know, it's the end of an era for us. And he looked at me and he said, or the beginning of a new one. And it was a very profound observation. If you don't acknowledge that it's the end of an era, if you're just in la-la land, oh, everything is so sweet. It's so good, you know, stupid things that people say at Shiva. You must be happy it's over. You ever heard the wise people at Shiva? You must be happy it's over. Yeah, I'm thrilled. Uh, at least he didn't suffer. Yeah, it's wonderful that he's dead. Uh, he must be in a very good place now. Oh yeah, wonderful place, but I would rather he would be in this wonderful place. Some people, Einstein said two things are infinite, the universe and stupidity. <laughs> And the latter is more infinite than the former. So I, in my, my uh, tenure, I uh, was privileged to hear a lot of people say a lot of wise things. If you don't acknowledge that it's the end, you also will never discover that it's a beginning. There's always the element of remorse, of regret, of pain. If you deny that, you're living in la-la land. And if you're living in la-la land, it's going to come back to bite you. When a person goes through a painful experience, a difficult experience, when we make bad mistakes, either by mistake or intentional, or some people make mistakes with us, I can't deny and the, the pain. I can't deny the need for remorse. Then it becomes futile. You're, you're, you're like you're drunk on a delusional reality that doesn't exist, and it's going to come to bite you. You have to integrate things. And in order to integrate sin into your life, you first have to get rid of it. You first have to go to the water and say, get out of my life. I don't like you. But then, in a later stage, you go back and you say, and now come back to my life. Because there's something I learned only from you. So even though it wasn't easy, but it's something, I am who I am today because of you. And the first person to do this was Jacob. He wrestles a whole night with an angel, a whole night. The guy wants to kill him. And then he maims him. He becomes a limping Jew. And then the guy says, leave me alone. And Jacob says, Lo I will not let you go until you bless me. Bless you? A gangster attacks you in a dark alley and then you tell them, wait, wait before you go, I want a bracha. <laughs> you call 911, you don't ask for blessings. Jacob was making a statement. When you encounter an adversary in your life that's trying to kill you, or at least make you limp, make you meek, make you weak, make your stature lower, smaller, you don't just run away. That's not enough. Because if you just run away, then the question is, why did you have it in the first place? Jacob says, I will not send you away until I don't get blessed from you. I have to come away from every challenge feeling more blessed. And that's when he gets his name, Yisrael, instead of Yaakov. Yaakov means you're holding on to a heel. Yisrael is two words, li rosh, my head. Kisarisa, you are a leader. You wrestled with God and men and you have prevailed. Kisarisa, melekim anashim And with this, Jacob set the bar for Jewish history. Throughout our history, we have encountered, sadly, so many adversaries. And not small adversaries. Profound adversaries. The approach of the Jewish people was always not... Let's just get rid of it and move on, which in itself is an incredible approach. They said more than that. We are going to become more blessed from every adversary we encounter. We're going to learn something. We're going to channel into a new blessing. We're going to see the end of an era also as the opportunity to open up a new era, to turn a new page. They say that Alexander the Great summoned a Jewish artist to depict a painting of him, but he gave him the following condition. The painting has to be accurate, plus I have to look handsome. The problem is the two were mutually exclusive. If it would be accurate, he would be ugly. If it would be 
handsome, it would be inaccurate. And those days, you didn't fulfill the request, you can come out with a head shorter. The problem was that he had a huge, um, a huge blemish, a huge wart on top of his eye, on top of his eyebrow. If the painter would eliminate it, it would be dishonest. If he would put it in, it wouldn't look good. So what did the Jew do? What would you do? He drew a painting of the king sitting in a state of deep meditation and reflection. So how do you sit like this? And the king was was so impressed. He loved it. He made the impression that he's thoughtful, he's reflective, he's an intellectual, par excellence. So you see what the Jew did? He took the very stain, he took the very blemish, and he turned it into art. He used that itself to convert it into art. That's what Jacob says. I will not just leave you. I want to feel more blessed from you. From every encounter you have to say, what did I learn from it? That's the holiness of sin. So that's why Rosh Hashanah, you go to the water and you throw away your sin. Sukkot, you got to go back and say, come back into my life. Let me grow from you. Let me learn from you. So now we understand why when we do the confession, we do it with a musical. Because there's two elements to confession. One is, I feel bad, I feel horrible, I'm sorry. But there's another message, and that is ultimately you went through all of this to create more music in your life. All of this will create more music, not more depression. Yes, you have to go through the remorse. You have to be able to say, I'm sorry. There's an element of humility in that. It doesn't feel good to say, I'm sorry. To call somebody up on the phone and say, I apologize, I did something terrible. It doesn't feel good, we don't like it. But there is a music that will come to you through that. It's not an act of, of destruction, of denigration. It won't diminish you, it will enhance you. And that's the plural of Shamnu. Repinchas of Karit says something very daring. He says, you know why you say we sinned? We, 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 who's the we? He says, we is me and God. But that's strange, God didn't sin, I sinned. That's where we come to the Arizal, this parallel universes. I choose in my world, God chooses in His world. If I do tshuva, I choose to align the two worlds. That my world should become a reflection of His world. If the sin becomes His choice, then if it's a godly act, if it's a godly act, it's good. If it's good, it's a mitzvah. How can a sin be a mitzvah? Because it led me to tshuva. So when I do this sin simultaneously, now this is heavy, God also does it. Or to put it simply, when I did it, I did it, but also God decided I should do it. But that seems like heresy. What do you mean? I'm responsible or he's responsible. No, I'm responsible. Because in my world, I did it. But he also chose for me to do it. Now what happens? So either we just remain in divergent paths, and that's it. And I'm responsible for my sin. Because that's the world, there's parallel universes. And in my world, I chose. When I do tshuva, I choose to redefine the sin from God's perspective. I align my world with His world. I put my fate and I link it to His destiny and fate. If God chose I should do this sin, that means it was a godly thing, it was a mitzvah. What makes it a mitzvah? What makes it a mitzvah is that it's a prerequisite for tshuva. You can't do tshuva if you don't sin. So for do tshuva you have to sin. So the sin is not a sin. The sin was the prerequisite for tshuva. But that can only happen if I do tshuva. If I do tshuva, I retroactively redefine my sin. And those are the two stages in every relationship. In a relationship we hurt people. That's part of a relationship. If you don't hurt, then you can't get hurt. You're not in a relationship. A husband who tells a wife, whatever you do, you will never affect me. <laughs> or a wife who tells a husband, whatever you do, you won't affect me. <laughs> They're not connected. You know, if I'm this invisible wall, if I'm this thick wall, you can't penetrate me, okay. No, we affect each other and we sometimes hurt each other. 
and then we apologize. All our relationships with children, with siblings, with parents, with spouses, with partners, with friends, with colleagues, with employers, with employees, with community members, we say things and we apologize. And then in stage B, we learn how from those mistakes, unprecedented growth happens. So I bless you, my dear friends, the Yom Kippur. You and I and all of us should have the courage to confess our sins, to apologize for our sins, and then to be able to see the holiness of our sins. Thank you.